what are the things that can help make you happier? And who do you think is the happiest generation here in the country? I happen to think it's me, my generation, but what do I know? The answer might surprise you. Psychologist and director of the Hartford Healthcare Center for Gender Health, Dr. Laura Saunders, is checking in with us with some hard truths. Doc, how are you this morning? I am well. Hello, friends. Happy Thursday. Yes, and we are actually focusing on the group that is the most unhappy, and believe it or not, it's the young people. When you yeah. say, you know, I'm now that I'm 60, doctor, 40 sounds young to me. How young are we talking? What's what, what do we mean when we say young? I think we're talking about, I mean, I'm not good with what's Gen Z and Gen X. I never know those designations, but um, I think we're talking about young people. I mean, people really under 30 or under 25. Okay. I mean, it's the young people that have a tremendous amount of, of pressure, um, you know, living situations, waning confidence in our government, um, less freedom to make life choices. The, we're in the comparison culture where social media creates all this comparison. Mm -hmm. It looks like everyone's life is better than yours. Um, so it's it's really hard for them. Well, you, I think you hit a lot of those topics now. I think Gen Z, the that that generation, it's like the younger millennials, Gen Z, and then younger. Social media has really wreaked havoc on so many people because you're constantly attached to your phone. You have to be updating. You're seeing what other people are doing. Everybody's life looks perfect, but people aren't making as much money and it's harder for them to be established. So you feel like you're attached to somebody else's, uh, you have no independence, no sense of independence, right? Right, a lot of those young people have had to move back at home because they can't afford um, you know, the lifestyle to which they wanna live. Uh, then that makes them sometimes feel emotionally regressed because now they're back living with their parents. Um, and so there's a lot of there's a lot of pressure. I mean, you know, there's things going on in the world. There's war. There's all sorts of things. And I think this really impacts our young people in, in a way that affects their worldview. Oh, can we what, what what are some of the changes we can do to make ourselves a little bit happier? You got any? So I always like to remind people that removing yourself from social media and really recognizing that someone else's life highlights gets compared to your low lights and you can't do that it's just not going to make you feel better and a dose of self-compassion mm, mm, those mm. are all really good tips but sometimes i think they're harder to do especially when you feel like you have to be so involved or you feel like you're behind uh, are there small things that you can do throughout the day to kind of give yourself those gentle reminders um I do think it's connecting with people live and in person, you know, making social connections. We've done a bunch of stories here or segments of, around how social connection really is life affirming and extends your life and it extends your your well-being, your physical health, making social connections, doing little things to prioritize what your own needs are, self-care. Um, that's physical health, emotional health, and mental health. Is, is it true that if the parents are unhappy, the kids are going to be tend to be unhappy? Should we be modeling for our children if, you know, practicing some of these own methods ourselves? Yeah, I mean, I certainly don't want anyone to fake that they're happy. And I always actually say happy is not necessarily even the standard. It's just okay. Yep. But it's doing things that prioritize your sense of well-being. And as parents and as adults, I do think it's important that we, you know, act in a way that that prioritizes our self-care. And that's very different from selfish because I don't like to use that word. Mm -hmm. That word really designates that people that are ignoring the needs of others when you do self-care you're you're putting your own needs first but you're modeling for others that taking care of yourself is important dr saunders i wanted to go back just a step because you were talking about that uh interpersonal one-on-one -on -one or just social interactions in real life in person i know that the pandemic really threw a wrench into a lot of younger people's real lives with that one-on-one -on -one connection so um with the internet, um, online dating, dating apps. How do people get back into having those interpersonal, interpersonal relationships? So when I meet young people and work with them, you know, clinically, I'm continually surprised at how the majority of their friendships are online, that they're not getting together with people in real life. Um, so it's it's taking small steps. I mean, if you're someone that's more shy or introverted or has some social anxiety, 
you know, do small things, connect with one person, you know, make a connection to your local library. Uh, every town has all sorts of activities. You know, pickleball is a huge craze. Join a little pickleball group. Do something active to make connections to people and get outside of yourself because that's ultimately what's going to help you feel better. Oh, all right. Thanks so much. I'm grateful for the show because Kate won't talk to me outside of this, oh, this social goodness. situation. So I'm grateful. He's crazy. Okay, maybe if you're a little kinder, it might help. <laughs> <laughs> Touche. All right, have a great day, Doc. Have a great day. Thank you. <laughs> Marcy.